I didn't hear you. No. <laughs> Just kidding. But what I'm not kidding about is I am so thankful that we have a forgiving God. Amen. And I am so thankful that we have a forgiving church. Because I need that this morning. Because it's been a busy week. And about 12.30 this morning I fell asleep doing my lesson. <laughs> so... Thank you, Greg, for asking that the, you know, your blessing there. Before I begin, if you'll indulge me for just a minute, can I use the word indulge in a Baptist church? Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I know Catholics do indulgences and stuff like that. I want to thank each and every one of you for your prayers and your support and the time that David and Barb and I have been going through in our move. Particularly, I want to thank you, Pastor. You've stepped into some very, very difficult moments. Nobody could have handled any of them better than you. And I appreciate so much everything you've done, all of your prayers. And if Teresa can hear back there, I want to thank Teresa too, because without her support of you, it, it, just, it just wouldn't be possible either. She reminds me a little bit of Mrs. Noah that I spoke of, or, or read to you about in, the, in my story of, uh, what is it, a couple weeks ago now? Because Mrs. Noah was an unsung hero, and she did so much to support the ministry. And were it not for her, we would, uh, you know, where would we be today? So I appreciate you both with all my heart. Thank you. Our lesson today concerns the Ark uh, of the Covenant being brought back to Jerusalem. And... Uh, The uh, introduction to this is kind of strange, but uh, we'll go with it anyways, okay? When I, was a, when I was a kid, which has been a long time ago, I loved vacation time. I mean, it was time that I looked forward to all year long. And weeks usually went into the, pre into the preparation of, of, you know, the family vacation. And uh, oftentimes we spent our, our vacation at a rustic cottage on Tawas Lake, which was up north to us because I lived in Saginaw at the time. And uh, the place, um, not too much unlike my house that we're moving from, had no running water, but at least it had a hand pump in the kitchen. <laughs> they had a wood cook stove. Well, the stove wasn't wood because that would be kind of defeat the purpose, but you put wood in it. And uh, the restroom was out back of the, of the cabin. And back then it seemed like one of the most horrible places you could possibly choose to go on vacation. But we still looked forward to going, but it just seemed, you know, it just seemed horrible to go to a place like that. But finally when the day would arrive and we'd pick up and leave on our great adventure, and it always was an adventure, there were always suitcases partially packed and, and waiting, you know, for, for mom to finish up the job at the last minute. And uh, after working on weekends, dad would be busy you know, seemed like for a month ahead, getting the car ready, you know, tune up oil changes and stuff to make the trip up here. And when the vacation was over and it was time to go home, everyone realized that all the planning and the effort was worthwhile. Um, good things, however, don't happen on their own. Uh, they take careful planning and, and an awful lot of preparation. <clears throat> and this is always necessary for the accomplishment of anything that's worthwhile. What made um, my vacation on Tawas Lake, or excuse me, what has my po vacation on Tawas Lake possibly got to do with bringing the ark back to, to Jerusalem? Um, and I asked myself that as I was writing this because I was trying to follow the outline that they had in the, in the, uh, gui in the uh, guide. It's a roundabout way of getting to the fact that David was about to accomplish the most significant, uh, probably the most significant Thing during his rule and to accomplish that <clears throat> he had to take he had to make careful plans he had uh, tried once before to bring the uh, the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem and uh, that ended in disaster and angry feelings he couldn't let he he couldn't let that happen again. He couldn't he it just it couldn't happen that way again. The Ark of the Covenant was a crucial symbol of God's power 
and his presence with the people of Israel. It had been carried with them, uh, as we know, before them in the wilderness. Um, Later, after the conquest of, of Canaan, it was housed in the tabernacle at Shiloh. And later still, after the ark was captured and returned by the Philistines, it ended up at Kirjath Jerem. And that happened at the time of Samuel the judge. And the ark remained at Kirjath Jerem throughout the entire reign of King Saul and into the opening of King David's rule. But David had established his throne in Jerusalem, and he believed that that's where the ark of the covenant should be. So his, his first attempt to transport the ark to Jerusalem was stopped by the death of one of the men that was involved in the moving of the ark. And uh, the ark was temporarily left at the home of Obed-Edom. And today's lesson records the successful move of the ark from Obed-Edom's home to Jerusalem. So first, I'd like us to turn to First Chronicles 15, 1 through 3. That's not Corinthians. It's, it's Chronicles. Okay. And if you all stayed there. Right. And the, the word of God says there. Uh, no, wait a minute. I'm not ready to read yet. Just a second. Here we find a place uh, being, in, in this part of the text, we find a place being readied for the ark. So verses 1 through 3 of of 15 in 1 Chronicles says, And David made him houses in the city of David, and prepared a place for the ark of God, and pitched for it a tent. Then David said, None ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. For them hath the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God, and to minister unto him forever. And David gathered all Israel together to Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord unto his place, which he had prepared for it. Here's the setting, um, so to speak, where we're at right now. Um, The events that lead up to the move. The ark remained in the house of Obed-Edom for three months, and the Lord blessed his house. The uh, The ark was there because of the disastrous first attempt that was made to move it to Jerusalem. The cart the ark was on was jostled, and uh, I'm sorry, but I have a hard time with some of these names. Is it Uzzah? Took hold of it to steady it, and God slew him. And that might seem rather severe, but it's, it's not, because God expects his instructions to be, to be carried out to the letter, and God made very specific instructions as to the movement of the Ark of the Covenant. And by, by grabbing a hold of it, even if this man was, even if this man was trying to secure its place, he violated... The, the laws that God set down about moving it. And, and it, it's a lesson, uh, even today, in our, in our sins, that as we violate God's principles and the laws that he's laid down for you and I, that there's a consequence for them. It might not be instant death like, like this man um, experienced, but, but there's a consequence. There were specific instructions given by God for the handling of the Ark of the Covenant, and he wanted them carried out and the man violated those. We're told in a parallel account in 2 Samuel chapter 6 that David became angry, and David was afraid of the Lord that day. David questioned how the ark ever should come to him in Jerusalem. How was he ever going to move it? So three months passed, and David heard how Obed-Edom's house was richly blessed due to the presence of the ark of the covenant being housed there. And just as you and I, you know, it reminds me of you and I, of you and I as uh, sons and daughters of the true and living God. The Ark of the Covenant was housed in this man's house, and he received rich blessings for it being there. God's Holy Spirit is housed in each one of us. And no matter what our circumstances are, we receive rich blessings because he dwells in us. His blessings were poured out on Obed-Edom, and his blessings are poured out on you and I. During these three months, David perhaps looked into the law of God and reviewed uh, the instructions that were given to Moses about the movement of the ark. 
He would try again, and this time David would do it right. Hiram, the king of Tyre, was a friend of David's, and, and he had been assisted, assisting David in building a home for himself. We won't turn to this account, but what I'm going to tell you can be found in 1 Chronicles 14.1, um, David, uh, that the king was assisting him. And David had also been building places for his family and setting up a tabernacle for the ark. Of course, the tabernacle is a tent. The original tabernacle was at Gibeon, uh, but with this new one ready, it was time to move the ark into it. As far as is known, the original temple, or excuse me, tabernacle remained at Gibeon until uh, Solomon completed the, new t the temple in Jerusalem. So uh, let's turn for a moment, please, to Second Chronicles um, chapter 5, verse 2 and verse 2 through 5. Because here we have an account of Solomon's bringing of the ark and the tabernacle of meeting up from um, the city of David to the temple. Chapter 5, verses 2 and 5, or 2 through 5, excuse me. And Solomon told out three score and ten thousand men to bear burdens and four score thousand to hew. That's the wrong one, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are you at Second Corinthians? <laughs> okay. Okay. I think. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribe, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel, unto Jerusalem, to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is in Zion. Wherefore, all the men of Israel assembled, the, assembled themselves unto the king in the feast which was in the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, came, and the Levites took up the ark. And they brought up the ark and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle. These did the priests and the Levites bring up. Apparently, the Mosaic tabernacle was stored at Jerusalem after the worship center at Gibeon was shut down. Uh, the tent that David built was a transitional place for the ark between the original tabernacle and Solomon's temple. As we read in 1 Chronicles 15, 2, there was planning for the move. God had given Moses very specific instructions for the movement of the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant and all the other articles um, concerned with it. Everything was to be done under the oversight of, a direct, of, a, of the direction or the oversight of, the descendant, of a descendant of Aaron. The larger... The larger body of the Levites were to do the actual moving of the ark, the physical moving. And their duties were very specifically laid out, as, as I've already said. The ark was to be covered with a veil, and it was to be uh, a covering made of badger's skin and a blue cloth, according to Numbers 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 5. Um, Also in Numbers chapter 4, it gives an account of what's to be done after everything has been dismantled. And, and so uh, perhaps we should, we should turn there and take a look at that. Numbers chapter 4. <clears throat> but we'll be coming back to First Chronicles. And we're going to look at verse 15. And when Aaron and his sons had made an end of covering the sanctuary and all the vessels of the sanctuary, as the camp is to set forward after that, the sons of Kohath shall come to bear it, but they shall not touch any holy thing lest they die. These things are the burden of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of the congregation. <clears throat> um, later in Numbers, we're also told that they were not given carts to make the move with as the, uh, they were to carry the ark, the burden upon their shoulders. And this explains why David ordered in First Chronicles 
uh, that none should carry the ark of God but the Levites. He had reminded himself that those were the ones God had specifically chosen for the task of moving the ark. The Levitic tribe had been set apart to lead in all worship of God and in the transportation of the tabernacle and everything associated with it while the, peop <coughs> with it, um, while the people were wandering in the wilderness uh, on their way to Canaan. Even though the cart had been... Uh, <laughs> excuse me. Even though they were attempting to move it on a cart the first time, um, Isaiah should have never been allowed to move the ark on it. We, re we read in uh, 1 Chronicles 15.3, there was a gathering of the people for David turned this incident into a great festival. The movement of the ark he made into a festival. According to the new commentary of the whole Bible, some are of the opinion that this was done on, uh, done on one of the three great festivals, uh, but at whatever time the ceremony took place, it was of great importance to summon a general convocation of the people. Many of the people might have had little or no opportunity of knowing anything about the Ark of the Covenant, which had been allowed to remain so long in obscurity and, uh, and neglect. It seems sad that that something this important to, to the nation of Israel was, was left in obscurity and neglect. But again, I think it harkens back unto ourselves when we, you know, become his sons and daughters and we're willing to let our lives fall back and we neglect uh, his presence within us and his calling to us and knowing what he wants us to do and his instructions. So there, there's a lesson in that for us as well. We can't let his temple fall into neglect. We can't let where he dwells today reside in obscurity. Second Samuel 6.15, and we won't turn there, but it tells us that it says, David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of trumpets. There was great joy, there was jubilation, there was a celebration. In David's mind, this was a matter of such great importance that he wanted the entire nation to be aware of, of, the, of the ark coming to Jerusalem. When Israel arrived in the land of Canaan, excuse me, Throughout the wilderness wanderings, the ark had been the primary symbol of God's presence with Israel. And when Israel arrived in the land of Canaan, the tabernacle had been set up in Shiloh, about 20 miles north of Jerusalem. It was still there when Eli, the high, um, when Eli was the high priest. During his day, the ark was taken to the battlefield when Israel was fighting the, uh, the Philistines. After God's hand of judgment came upon the Philistines, <clears throat> they eventually returned the ark, and it ended up in uh, Kirith Jerem, where it stayed for nearly 100 years. From this, it's easy to see why the ark had not been thought of by many people in Israel. David intended to bring it back into the, into the prominence that it, that it had been once given, and into the prominence that it, that it still deserved. Um, well, let's look at uh, First Chronicles uh, again in 15, verses 14 through 16. <clears throat> so the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. And the children of the Levites bear the ark of God upon their shoulders with the staves thereon, as Moses commanded according to the word of the Lord. And David spake to the chief of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be the singers with instruments of music, psalteries, and harps and cymbals, sounding by lifting up the voice with joy. <clears throat> as we see... <coughs> 
excuse me, as we see the leaders being readied for the task, um, the the uh, Levites were were uh, to appoint um, the the uh, ones that would conduct the music and the festivities that were involved with with the with the moving of the uh, of the ark. As I already um, told you, if the Ark of the Covenant was to be moved according to God's instructions, it had to be done by the priest and the Levites. Those who were the leaders are named in, uh, are named in uh, verse 11, and uh, David referred to them as the heads of the Levites uh, of their father's houses and told them to prepare and sanctify themselves and those who would serve with them. David's explanation of this particular command reveals his understanding that they had done that they had done this proper had they done this properly the last time <clears throat> the last time that they tried to move the ark they wouldn't have to be doing it you know again and uh, wouldn't have cost lives and caused caused the anger and, and amongst the, the people there at any rate, this was an admission that they had neglected to consult with God about the procedure before they attempted it. And again, that harkens back to us because any time we don't consult with God before we attempt anything, it's, it's pretty much doomed to failure. Yes, sir. I'd like to pick on any particular you know, denomination, but what you say is so true especially about music and, and uh, modern music being brought into worship services as uh, in um, different congregations that I saw down in Saginaw that were Pentecostal and they brought in Christian rock music and there there was no permanence to the people there there were people coming there were people going and whereas you know when when you when you separate yourself and you stick to what God's word says as as our church does there's a permanence, you know, among us, I think. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. And I agree, he didn't try to move that. I mean, he didn't have a bad intent in trying to move that and trying to study the ark. I think his intent was, was uh, you know, was good. But he just didn't follow God's direction. Which means that the, the, the saying, what's the saying? The means, the end do not justify the means. Mm-hmm. That's yes. That's you right. Anything, you can't as long as you don't violate God's word. <laughs> it, yep. Exactly. That has to be the perimeters, Donna. <clears throat> that's one of the reasons I'm kind of um, a little bit skittish about some of my stories. Bec you know, because um, I wrote them with the best intent, but they were written for bus bus kids, and there was a different standard, unfortunately. For bus kids, they weren't run past, you know, a pastor. Um, it was left to my discretion, and I trusted, I, you know, I trust God, and, of course. But um, it, it, it was it was a different it was a different standard, and so we do have to be very careful what we introduce to our children, whether they be bus kids or whether they be the kids from our church. They're equally important. Okay. Um, let's see, where were we? Thank you. Um, David's explanation for this particular command uh, reveals his understanding that they had not uh, tried to make the move properly the first time that they tried to move the ark, and because they had not, the Levites because they had because they had not had the Levites performing that work, uh, the anger of the Lord had burst out upon them. They. Uh, it, it was just as simple as that. This was an admission that they had neglected to consult with God about the procedure before they attempted it. It was of utmost importance that the priests and Levites carry out the procedure as prescribed in the scriptures and that they be completely pure in doing so. Everyone followed God's command. Everyone followed God's commands. They sanctified themselves and carried the ark on their shoulders by means of poles that were run, run through the rings that were attached to the ark to the corners of the ark. 
And this was exactly as Moses commanded according to the word, <clears throat> uh, according to the word of God in uh, First Chronicles 15.15, 15, which we just looked at. No detail was being left out or slighted. Extreme care was taken in doing exactly what God had specified that he wanted them to do the second time. And perhaps we should take light of, uh, a note of this in light of current practice, how careless many believers are about obedience to God's word, and we talked a little bit about that. Some seem to think that they may choose which parts to obey and which parts not to obey, what's convenient for you, what's not convenient for you or me. But it doesn't work that way. We, must, we have to realize that, this is very, that it's a disrespectful view of the Bible, that it disrespects God, that it was given to us entire and that we're not, uh, we don't have the option of picking and choosing what, what suits us. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, according to 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. So all scripture should and must be obeyed if we're going to have the most profitable life in Christ that we can have. In uh, verse 16, um, we, we read about the, the music and have you noticed how often music was used as part of special events recorded in the Old, that were recorded in the Old Testament? Music is important to praise, and it, and it was used in the, in the Old Testament. And, and, and you'll notice that instruments were used in the Old Testament um, for praise. There are churches today that will, not, that will not let a piano be used in their church to praise God. When, when you play that piano... The, the song that we sang this morning and you're playing the piano was as significant to me as any lesson that I could give. Amen. It, it was. I mean, um, music praises God. And, and David knew that. King David knew that. And music became a, a large part of this festivity of bringing the ark back to Jerusalem. The Levites were to carefully appoint those who would lead in the musical worship on this particular occasion. Uh, there was to be singing with instrumental accompaniment, and all of it was to be done in a way that would express the joy in the hearts of those involved, just as the singing and the music in, expresses the joy in our hearts. The Levites appointed Heman, Asaph, and Ethan to play the, um, to play the brass cymbals, along with others who would be effective in this ministry. There are those who prefer... Music and church services to all be, always be very quiet and very meditative, and I don't think that's what God wanted. We don't have to always be to sedate. We can sing out loud like we did this morning. I think that that shows our praise to him. We sing out with joy, with, with gladness. Notice, however, the instrumentation mentioned here. Um, you will see that, sound was, that, that the sound was indeed boisterous. It wasn't quiet. Um, the stringed instruments were har and harps were accompanied by cymbals, and we will soon see the mention of other instruments also. Joyful music does much to cheer people up and express the joy and thanksgiving that fills our hearts. It's a, it's... Yeah, that's a good point. And because, <clears throat> and because the drums are such a, a worldly instrument, are you laughing at me? Yeah, I'm just smiling. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why? No, it's gone. I'm curious. Yeah, I don't know. I concur with that. Oh, okay. There'll be no drums in our church. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> There's a few dents in there. <laughs> but the drum is, I think, a worldly instrument. And, and as you look at its roots, it, um, especially in modern music, it is, it is to, uh, to go along with the, uh, the more sensual. And, and it doesn't really, I don't think, have a place in worship. It has a place in... in Africans used drums, the Indians used drums. Yep. And, to, and that was to get the, get the spirit moving. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. But if the Spirit's not moving that God puts it in it, that makes it a whole big difference. It does. It, it does indeed. And, and its history, though, um, isn't, isn't a good history. All right. I'm going to uh, to move on to the to the close of, of the lesson today because I could go on for uh, for another hour with what's with what's here. But the the thing that that Pastor pointed out when when he spoke a moment ago, the lesson that he pointed out is I, is is one of the main thrusts that we that we should that we should get out of that, that, that we need to separate ourselves from the world, that we need to follow God's instructions. We saw, or we see in the text today, that to not follow God's instructions, there is a consequence. It may not be immediate death, but the consequence of our sins is always death. And uh, it was rather dramatically illustrated in the lesson today. And I'd like to conclude with, with this. David learned the hard way that there was a wrong way to move the Ark of the Covenant. When he, had used, when he had used a cart, Uzziah died because he reached out quickly to steady the ark when the oxen stumbled. Now, after a bit of research, David realized that God required the ark to be carried on the, shoulder of, on the shoulders of the Levites. Experience is a great teacher, but the process is often painful, and each and every one of us know that. One thing we learn from experience is that we often fail to learn from the experience. And, and when we don't learn from the experience, then we have problems. God is a God of abundant mercy. And that's something you and I can count on at all times, his mercy and his forgiveness. Um, I'm not saying that he extends mercy to those who die without accepting um, Jesus' saving grace. That doesn't happen. We know that. But according to Hebrews 9.27, it says that it is appointed unto man once to die. But after this, the judgment, if a person rejects Christ during his lifetime, he dies without any hope whatsoever. It is true, however, that God gives people many opportunities to repent and to, to confess Christ as their Savior. Amen. And few of us respond the first time, or responded the first time that we heard the gospel. Some of us did. Um, I didn't. It was a growing process. It's also true that God in his grace allows us to make mistakes. But even then, like David, he gives us uh, two or even three or unlimited opportunities to make that mistake right. David and the people had a great time of worship and celebration as they brought the Ark of God's Covenant back to Jerusalem. Or to Jerusalem. We celebrate birthdays, anniversaries, um, promotions, graduations with dinners and parties. Celebration is all around us. Each Sunday is a celebration of the res resurrection of Jesus Christ as we gather to worship the God who is worthy of our honor and praise because without him we have nothing and we are nothing. One pastor I had at one time when I was uh, just saved told me I was nothing but pond scum. And I got so mad at him. I said, how dare you? How dare you? But he's right, you know. We are nothing without him and without his righteousness. And on that, I'll close. And I will ask Cecil, if you would please, close in prayer. <clears throat>